In today's video, we're gonna learn how to do a chi-square test for AP Biology and interpret what it means. So let's begin. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and you might be joining us today from our previous videos on linkage and linkage mapping. In the linkage mapping video, I specifically mentioned that you could use a chi-square test in order to see whether the two genes that we're analyzing were actually linked or whether they were independently assorting but simply throwing random numbers that might look like linkage but maybe weren't. Now, from the example that I gave in that video, it was pretty obvious that the two genes were linked and the genes were not independently assorting, providing that one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio but what if those numbers were pretty close to one to one to one to one? Where do we draw the line to say that these genes were linked or not? And that is where chi-square test comes in. The chi-square test is a statistical method that tells you whether a distribution that you see follows the distribution that you would expect from the order of the universe or from other informed data that you have on hand. And if you're already pretty familiar with the chi-square test, then you can skip right ahead to that part of the video where we perform the chi-square test on the data set from the previous video. But if you're not that familiar with the chi-square and you're here to find out what the test is all about, then let's go ahead and do that right now with a simpler example. And just like every other YouTube video on the chi-square test, I'm going to be using a simple example of a coin toss to demonstrate what the chi-square test is supposed to be. But I will put a little twist to that with a little story. Now imagine that it's year 2000 and you're walking down the street and you find a coin on the ground and it's a silver dollar, a relatively rare coin. You start thinking it's your lucky day until you look up and you realize that you're standing in front of a magic store. Yeah, that was sort of a thing back in the early 2000s. Millennials were super into close up magic, but I digress. So here you are standing in front of the magic store wondering if that silver dollar is real or if it's a cheat coin. A cheat coin, of course, would land on its heads or tails disproportionately, not 50-50%. But being a good scientist that you are, you decide to take that coin home and perform a little experiment. And in this experiment, you're going to flip that coin 100 times and record record the data and figure out whether that coin is landing on his heads and tails equally. And here is where that natural order of things come into play. As you're aware, a fair coin is supposed to land on its heads and on its tail roughly 50% of the time. That is the expected frequency distribution of outcomes you would expect from a fair coin. And in this story, let's say that you do flip that coin 100 times and you get 57 heads and 43 tails. Now this does seem pretty good because of course we would not expect the heads and tails to be exactly 50 and 50. That would also be a very unlikely scenario. However, what does 57 and 43 mean? Does that actually mean that the coin is fair or does it mean that it's a cheat coin? Well, I think most people would agree that that's probably a pretty good outcome from the expected ratio of one to one, but I can start changing the story a little bit and making it a little bit more difficult for us to accept that fact. For instance, what if it was 59, 41, or perhaps it was 62, 38? And as I push this deviance further and further and further, I'm sure all of us are gonna draw the line somewhere and say, hey, look, this I'm not comfortable with. It's probably a cheat coin. Except the problem is that where you might draw that line and where Bobby might draw that line and where Lauren or me, Mikey, might draw that line may be different from one another. And that's not so good in science. Remember that in science, we all wanna agree on certain objective facts. And in order for us to say, look, based on the conditions of this experiment, this is the acceptable amount of deviance from the expected and this is not, well, that particular line must be drawn. And that is what chi-square test allows us to do. By running the statistical test with the given situation at hand, we're able to say, this is the line. So let's go ahead and run our chi-square test on 57 heads and 43 tails and see if that actually follows the expected frequency distribution. Now the chi-square formula will be given to you on the day of the exam, but it's not a bad idea to have it memorized. It goes something like this. Chi-squared equals the summation of observed minus expected values squared divided by expected. Now before you start the chi-square calculations, you usually establish something called the null and the alternate hypothesis. But for now, we're gonna put that on hold because I think that creates additional confusion that we don't need right now. So let's just go to our table first and fill out these values. The observed minus expected is a simple calculation. 57 minus 50 giving us seven for the first row and 43 minus 50 giving us negative seven for the second row. Squared of these values is of course 49 in both of the rows. That value divided by expected should be the same in both because we are expecting 50 and 50 for heads and tails. So that's going to give us 0 0.98 in both of the rows. Now the sigma symbol tells us to sum everything up. And in this case, that will simply be 1.96. 
And so far, that's just middle school math. But the problem is, what does this actually mean? And before we introduce you to the chi-squared probability distribution table, let's pause for a moment and think about how this chi-square value would change if the deviance was greater or if the deviance was lower. And by deviance, I mean how far off were the observations that we made from the expected. So for example, a greater deviance would have resulted in something like 60 and 40, or 65 and 35 heads and tails respectively, and less deviance would have been like 51 and 49. Now, the greater the deviance, the greater the value of observed minus expected would be. Whether we're talking about observed minus expected lands in the positive or the negative, it doesn't matter because we're going to square it anyway. The point is that the farther off the value that you observe from the expected, the bigger this number is going to be. And notice how this number is at the numerator. And as a result, the entire chi-square value will get bigger and bigger and bigger the farther we were from the expected value. Now, on the other hand, the closer we were to the expected value, the lower that chi-square value would be because the observed minus expected would be ultimately very low. And at this point, we can start to infer a little bit about what this chi-square is going to tell us. The bigger the chi-square value, the greater deviance there is, the more likely that this is a cheat coin. The smaller the chi-square value, the less deviance there is, more likely that it's following exactly that 50-50% frequency of heads and tails. But the truth is that you can't make any conclusions about that chi-square value unless you have a chi-square table on hand. So that's what we'll look at now. On this table, you'll see that the leftmost column is called the degrees of freedom. And along the top row, you have all of these p-values ranging from 0.99 to 0.01. We'll talk more about what p-values are in a few moments. Let's start with the degrees of freedom. While degrees of freedom is actually a pretty complicated concept, for now we can think about degrees of freedom as the number of possible outcomes minus one. In this case, we had heads or tails, so that's two outcomes minus one is simply one. So we're only gonna be focusing on the top row of this table. Now under the row that contains the p-values, all of the numbers that you see within 0.001 or 0.004, these are all of the chi-square values. Now recall that our chi-square value was 1.96. Now it's our job to find out where that 1.96 six lies. In this table, our 1.96 lies somewhere between the p-values of 0.9 and 0.1. Now, this table lacks a little bit of resolution between 0.9 and 0.1, but there's a reason why that's the case. All we have to know is that our p-values lie somewhere above this green bar, which is 0.05. Now, the chi-square value under 0.05 for degrees of freedom of 1 is 3.841. This is often called a critical value. Now, our calculated chi-square value of 1.96 is less than 3.841, and as a result, our p-value is greater than 0.05. Now, I know that that's a lot to take in, but there's something really important to be said here about the interpretation of this table. Remember earlier when we said that the chi-square value would be really big if the deviance was greater and smaller if, if the deviance was lower? Now, I think you can see from this table that if the deviance was really big and the chi-square was really big, then the p-value would get smaller and smaller and smaller. And if the deviance was smaller, the chi-square would be commensurately smaller and the p-value would be greater. Now, why this matters is that the green line that you see on the table, well, that's the line that we draw in science, a p-value of 0.05. If the p-value that we correlate to our chi-square value is greater than 0.05, like in our case, we would say that the deviance is sufficiently small that this is not a cheat coin. So then what does the p-value actually mean? The p-value is simply the probability of seeing the results that you see given that the coin is fair. So in science, we're basically saying that if the results that you see only occurs in less than 5% of all the potential outcomes, then that is where we start to say that this might be a cheat coin. So the bar is relatively high. This is also something that we call statistical significance, as in if the p-value is less than 0.05, then we have statistically significant results that indicate that the coin is perhaps not a fair one. And now we can throw in the idea of null and alternate hypothesis. As the name suggests, the null hypothesis would indicate that the coin is not a cheat coin, and the alternate would be that the coin is not a fair coin. And as you may have learned in school, the discovery of a p-value of less than 0.05 would mean that you would have to reject the null hypothesis. Now, if you reject the null hypothesis that the coin is fair, then the alternate hypothesis is that the coin is not fair. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, then you would simply say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the hypothesis that the coin is a fair one still stands after your experiment. Going back to our original linkage problem, we saw that the distribution of the offspring phenotypes were not following one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio with 398 
104, 96, and 402 offsprings in the respective categories that you see on the screen. Now, when we calculate the values for each row that contributes to the chi-square value, we have 87.62, 85.26, 94.86, and 92.42. These are massive, massive values because there was such great deviance from what we would expect it to see. Now, summing all those up, we have a chi-square value of 350.16. Now, even though the degrees of freedom increases to three because there were four possible categories, this chi-square value will be still pretty high. And if I actually use a chi-square calculator online, it would tell me that the p-value is actually less than 0 0.0001. This means that the results that we see has less than 0.01% chance of occurring if our null hypothesis that these genes were independently assorting were to be true. Now, had we formulated a proper null hypothesis that these are independently assorting genes, then a p-value of 0 0.0001, which is certainly less than 0 0.05, would allow me to reject that null hypothesis, accepting the alternate that the genes are not independently assorting. And that would give us some statistical confidence that the genes were actually linked, which would then give us the ability to map those genes using linkage mapping. Now, while this topic is not necessarily exciting or easy, I hope you understand how important the chi-square test is in determining whether the frequencies that we observe in nature are following what we expect to see, because it's not only in genetics where we can use this. We'll see chi-square popping up again in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and even in experimental design where we're using choice chambers to observe animal behavior. So what do you guys think? Chi-squared, is that okay? If not, then leave a comment below and we'll try to help you out further. If you haven't done so already, click that like button and press subscribe for more videos on AP Biology content. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video.